Hello, Saints. I'm Arnett, and this is Zebulun, where the truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, for she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed saying, if anyone worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his hand or in his forehead, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel and in the presence of the lamb. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark of his name. Normally I don't share all three angels, but today I just felt impressed. I normally just share the first angel calling people to the hour of God's judgment. But the second angel is a call to calling people out of Babylon. It was given once in 1844, the midnight cry. That's the first cleansing of the sanctuary, of the temple. Remember, Jesus cleansed the temple twice. And then at the end of his ministry, the final week of his life, he cleansed it again. That's the, mid, that's the loud cry of Revelation 18. And remember last time we talked about the fact that the, mid, the loud cry of Revelation 18 is not the same angel as the second angel that said Babylon is falling at the midnight cry. Many people uh, in Adventism describe this as the fourth angel's message, but it's a repetition of the second angel's message, but with more emphasis because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit described in, Reve in Revelation 18, verses 1 through 6, where the angel enlightens the whole world with its glory. But today, what we're going to do is finish up verses 11 to 16, I mean, 11 to 24 in uh, chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. And I want you to remember that as we study that's one of the ways that you get the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to guide our study. But as you study, the Holy Spirit is coming into your, your, your body, your, your being, your soul. Joel talks about the two olive trees, which represents the Old and New Testament, and the pipes that go to the clay lamp. You're that clay lamp. And as you study the Bible, Old and New Testament, the oil of the Holy Spirit goes into your lamp and it fills your lamp. And then Jesus, the light of the world, kindles a flame and your light shines. Because God doesn't want you to just get oil, 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 but he wants you to let your light shine. When your light shines, you're sharing the three angels' message. You're sharing the gospel. You're sharing the everlasting gospel. You're loving people. You're treating people right. You're being honest. Right now, I'm, my light's shining. Right now, I'm st storing up treasure in heaven by letting my light shine. And um, so let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your word. And as we study, we pray that the Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher. Lead, guide, and direct us. Put your words in my mouth. Give me clarity of thought and speech. Give those that are listening understanding and may we be filled with your holy spirit even more in our lives because it brings all other blessings in its train we pray and ask these blessings in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen well let's move deliberately because we have a lot to cover tonight and uh i've been gone out into nature i go out to nature every now and then i live in the mountains and uh, my wife and I love the beach, the oceans, and we spent four days out at the ocean just restoring our soul 
you know, I like to study the Bible, but did you know nature is another one of God's books? And as we behold and, and uh, nature, we um, experience God's love and creativity and it recreates us. It, that's why they call it recreation. It's recreation. And uh, it's relieving of stress and building our spirit up strong. I'm 67 years old, but I feel strong because I keep the Sabbath. Every week I get a rest because I go out in nature, because I study God's word, because I have the Holy Spirit. And um, I'm sharing this just because it's a blessing. And, uh, um, and partly that's why I haven't put out a video for, this is like the eighth day. I usually put, up, put one out every five or six days, but it's been about seven or eight days. But anyway, I digress. These verses, verses 11 to 16 of Revelation 18, it's the second half. Describe the extreme anguish of the capitalist merchants when they see that their trust in Babylon has all been in vain. Who are these capitalist merchants in the end times? Amazon, Nike, Facebook, Google, Walmart, pharmaceutical companies, and many, many more. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. See, the saints are not going to be weeping and mourning over Babylon when it's destroyed. They're going to be rejoicing and singing and praising the Lord for his judgments, for their righteous. But the, but the merchants who have been making themselves rich off the people are going to be mourning because their system is, come, is falling apart. Here's, here's what uh, Revelation 17, verse 4 says. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Remember we talked about they made it so God's people can't buy and sell, and now at the end they can't sell their own merchandise. Nobody's buying and selling their stuff. Merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and pure purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and the souls of men. Did you know that there's human trafficking slavery going on today in the year 2023 the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Um, she's clothed in purple and scarlet. Those are the colors of the papacy. I've shown you pictures of that before. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. You know, when you go to the Vatican, you, that's, all, that's all you see is the gold and, and precious stones and everything like that. It's, it's the opposite of the humble Christ who rode in on a donkey. Um, you put the two pictures together, they're just opposites. Christ was humble and plain, and they're all decked out with uh, worldly glitter. <clears throat> and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. So her end is going to come quickly. One hour means quickly. Literally, in the day year principle, it would be 15 days. But I don't know if it's literally, you know, 15 days or if it's just a short period of time. Either way, it's a short period of time. These verses describe the reaction of the merchants of the earth when Babylon falls apart. See, they stand back from her because they know that she's being judged, but it's too late because they're, they're already connected to her irreversibly. 
and they're going to receive of her plagues and her judgments because they they partook in her sins these who weep and well are gr the great men of the earth in that day the amazons the facebooks the googles of the world will see that the accumulation of wealth at the expense of the poor has cost them eternal life the wicked do not lament because they have sinned they lament because they have lost their riches and with their riches they've lost eternal life time and again as the plagues are being poured out we are told that the wicked refuse to repent they don't truly repent they're weeping and wailing because they're losing all of their precious mansions Ellen White describes the reason for the lamentation of the wicked. The rich bemoan the destruction of their grand houses. See there? The scattering of their gold and silver. But their lamentations are silenced by the fear that they themselves are to perish with their idols. They've been deceived. The wicked are filled with regret, not because of their, of their sinful neglect of God, and their fellow men, but because God has conquered. They lament that the result is what it is, but they do not repent of their wickedness. They would leave no means untried to conquer if they could. The people see that they have been deluded. We've read this before, but it's worth repeating because it's such an important quote from the great controversy. If you haven't read that book, you've got to read it. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping the bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. I have people come to me and they're, they're having different religious leaders tell them these false teachings of Babylon and leading them astray. And when they're lost because of these false doctrines, they're going to go to these religious leaders with bitter complaints. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things they have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now, in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. And there's even religious leaders like that in every church, including my church, uh, that are preaching peace and safety and are not preaching the straight testimony of Revelation and Daniel. The multitudes are filled with fury. We're lost, they cry. And you are the cause of our ruin. But you know what? It's, you can't blame somebody else. There's a song I sing. It's called um, Nobody's Fault But Mine. It's nobody's fault but mine. And if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. I got a Bible I can read if I choose. And I got two knees and I can pray if I choose. So if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. My mama taught me how to pray. Angels have watched over me night and day. So if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. The Father done sent us his Son. Jesus done paid the price. The Holy Ghost has entreated my soul, and it's nobody's fault but mine. It's nobody's fault, nobody's fault, nobody's fault. But my. Anyway, that's a song. That's an old song. 
but the words are true. You can't blame anybody if you're lost but yourself. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds, the very ones that one that they once admired, the, the very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords that were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. This is during the time of trouble, and this is when the uh, waters are dried up, and then they turn on the Babylon. The extreme anguish of the wicked is expressed with several intense Greek words. The first of these is kaleo, which is translated be well. And they give many verses here. You can take a picture of them, look them up, pause the video, but I'm just going to look up one. Uh, I'm mainly going to look up the ones in James because I noticed there's James here, James here, James over here. And so um, I want to stay in that book. So James 5, verse 1. We're just looking at the word be well. Go to now, ye who, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. So we're looking at the word, which means be well. Let's see. Do I see be well? I guess it would be um, rich man weep and howl. Well, let's look it up. Uh, I'm not in a rush. Clio. Let's see which word is Clio. I'm not sure. Uh, is it weep? There it is. Clio. See there? Let's make it bigger. Weep. Clio. And what and how? is a different word. So it's weep, weeping is translated. Who's weeping? The rich men. Why? Because your miseries that shall come upon you. Look at this, verse 2. Let me go back to the red road right? Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. Many people are buying gold because they know this. They know they're changing to a digital dollar. They know the economy is going to collapse. But you know what? Your gold is not going to save you. Only trusting in God is what's going to save you in these last days. And the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You should be using that money instead of buying gold. You should be investing in buying great God controversies and passing them out. And buying tracts and re religious liberty and passing it out. And using your money for ministry, you have heaped up treasure together for the last days and see your treasures, all that money heaped up, it's going to testify against you. You need to store up treasure in heaven where, mo where moth cannot uh, devour it. They can't reach it. When you get Bible studies, you're storing up treasure in heaven. When you help visit prisoners, when you feed the homeless and give them clothes, you're storing up treasure in heaven. When you share the gospel with people, you're storing up. It goes on, but I'm, I'm going to, it's a warning to the rich, but uh, I don't have time to read all of it. The second word is pentheo, which means to mourn. It's a sadness. It's a deep sadness. Like when some, when a loved one dies, you mourn. Your heart is broken. And we see that in James 4, verse 9. But I'm going to read verse 8 through 10 because the other scriptures around it help. And we're going to look for the word pentheo. Uh, James 4, 8. So we'll just go back one. 4, 8 through 10. I, I have it in yellow. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. That's one of my favorite scriptures. How close can you get to God? 
You can get as close as you want, saints. How do you get close to them? It's simple. Bible study and prayer. And see, when you study the Bible, you pray for strength to be obedient. See, don't forget that part. And when you do that, God draws even closer to you. And he'll get as close to you as you want. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. We cannot serve two masters. We're studying that in our Sabbath school lessons. Christ is my master. I'm a slave to Christ. I can't have any other master. And then here's the word. Be afflicted and mourn. This is telling the righteous to mourn. Mourn for the sins of the people in the world. Mourn for the sins even in the church. Mourn for those who are preaching soft things when they should be preaching a straight testimony. Mourn for those who are ashamed of and denying the sanctuary message. Mourn for those who are despising the word of prophecy and the ministry of Ella White. Mourn for those that are teaching false doctrines and the wine of Babylon and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning because it's sad. Because these people are going to get the mark of the beast and they're going to receive the wrath of God without mixture in the cup of his indignation. And they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And they're going to have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark of his name. So we need to weep and mourn for them. Turn your joy into heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Whew, that's powerful. That is beautiful. Anyway, the word mourn, let's look it up. Let's look it up. Bam. Wait, I get confused when I do that. What verse are we in? Verse 9. Because see, it's not highlighted when I go to verse 9. Verse 9, mourn. There you go, pentheo. See, there's that word. I hope you can see it's big enough. Pentheo. When I make these words bigger, the uh, Strong's Concordance doesn't get bigger. Oh, well. The third word is kapto, which means to lament. Like the Book of Lamentations where Jeremiah is weeping because the Israel won't listen to him. He told him to surrender to Babylon and they stubbornly won it and he cried for them Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they wouldn't listen we're supposed to do the same thing this one is not in James this is Revelation 1 verse 7 very beginning of the book of Revelation is turned there Revelation 1 7 Revelation one in verse seven. Let's go out of the concordance. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Who's that? The second coming of Christ. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people who have rejected the three angels' message shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And the word wail in verse 7 is kapto. See? Kapto. Wail. They're wailing because they're lost. That must be the most bitter wailing that there is because you're going to cease to exist when you could have had eternal life as a free gift oh bitter bitter lamentations the first fourth word is kraso or kreso that is translating 
let it cry. See, the Greek is very rich in these different words for, they all mean crying, but they all have a different nuance to them. This, this word, this appears, this word appears twice in Revelation. 18 verse 18 and 19 and it is also used to describe Jesus crying out on the cross when he died and a woman crying out in travail we're going to look at Revelation 18 18 and then James 5 4 Revelation 18 18 In James 5, 4, 18, 18, and cried, there it is there, when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? So that, that's, that's right where we are. And they cried here again, twice. But let's go to James. Um, the disciples crying out for fear, the demons crying out, the wicked mob crying out for the blood of Stephen, and the wages withheld from the laborers crying out to heaven. That's the one, James 5, 4. Remember I said we're going to stick in James quite a bit. James 5, 4. James is a, one of my favorite books. 5, verse 4. Now, this is what we were reading before, but we didn't get to verse 4. Look at this one. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields. These are the people that work for the rich people, the maids, the gardeners. Which is which of you kept back by fraud? See, their labor, their hire has been kept back by fraud. In other words, you're not paying them what they should be getting, especially consider, considering that you're a millionaire. In some cases, billionaire and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the lord of sabbath see the lord hears and he's going to remember when the cup fills up remember we talked about that you have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton wanton how wanton means lacking you've been living in pleasure on the earth but you're lacking in terms of treasure in heaven you have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Wow. Another sign of the affliction and angst of the wicked is the sprinkling of dust upon their heads. So let's go back a minute. I don't want I don't mean to rush through these. So if you're rich, if you're if you're listening to this and you're rich, be generous to your laborers. I'm by no means rich, but you know, I try to if I go out to eat, try to, you know, try to be generous with um, people that are serving you um, in your tipping. Um, when you're buying stuff, somebody's selling something and, and you buy from them, go ahead and be generous with them if you're doing better than they are. I think that's what it's saying. It's not, it's not just the super rich, but all of us have people under us financially. Be generous with them. Another sign of the affliction and angst of the wicked is the sprinkling of dust upon their heads. Okay, Revelation 18, 19. I'm not going to turn there, though, because this list of merchandise. Okay, you see all the merchandise we listed, ivory, gold, uh, all those things. It includes necessities things that you just need, commodities, things that you would buy, and luxuries, things that you just would like to have. So it really includes almost everything. It includes basically most of the items of trade in the ancient world. And therefore, it represents the fact that the capitalists exerted total control over the world economy and therefore live in luxury. So some of the things that listed seem kind of weird to us, but he's describing the, the things that the rich would buy in those days. There are 28 items mentioned on the merchandise list. Some of the items on this list are staples and others are luxuries. The list includes items that were common in the days of John. 
God spoke to the prophet in the context of his time. If a prophet were to arise today, or if he were describing things today, the prophet would speak of maybe stocks, bonds, Wall Street, iPhones, iPads, widescreen televisions, fancy automobiles, expensive properties and mansions, uh, villas and 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 vacation homes, uh, motor homes. He, he, he would be mentioning some of those fine clothes. Um, the main point is that before her fall, Babylon had a stranglehold on all the commerce of the world and used it to oppress God's people by refusing to allow them to buy and sell or participate in the economy, to pressure them like they did with the prick. They threatened to, fi to fire people from their job unless they went along with the mandate. That was a little sample of what's coming. Of particular interest are the last two items on the list, the bodies and souls of men. The word, the word bodies refers to the present physical life of a person. Okay? This is my body. And a bad guy can kill my body. But my soul, he can't touch. Only God can destroy the soul. The soul is your eternal being. And when I say eternal being, it doesn't mean that you that you're that you live on after death. You sleep and your breath goes back to God. But he he can reunite that breath and reconstruct your body and you live again. The devil can't touch that. He can kill this body, but God can resurrect me. He can't touch that. But God can can leave you unresurrected or you know, kill you and you where you the second death, there's no resurrection from that. That's what you need to be afraid of. Not the first death. The first death is just asleep for the righteous. Here's the Bible. Do not fear those who kill the body. In other words, they take away our present physical existence, but cannot kill the soul. They cannot take away our eternal life. Cain killed Abel. But he and he took away his present physical existence, but he's going to be resurrected to eternal life. Cain couldn't touch that, but rather fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell, which is the lake of fire. Who is that? That's our heavenly Father, the Ancient of Days, God, Jehovah. Elsewhere in Revelation, the word souls is used to describe those who are killed for refusing to practice the false worship of Babylon. Babylon not only traded with the physical bodies of human beings, but also toyed with their very salvation and eternal destiny. They, they, um, they traded in physical bodies and eternal destinies. They caused some people to be lost with their lies. That's bad. Verse 17 and 19. The lament of the employees and travelers. <clears throat> verse 17 reads, every shipmaster. Now we're reading through Revelation 18. We're on verse 17. If you want to follow in your Bibles. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Now the ships on the sea is how they traded these numerous goods um today it would be like uh the trucking industry air transit ups air travel amazon um uh fedex 
that would be how we would describe it in our day. Verse 20, heaven rejoices. See, the wicked are weeping and wailing. They're seeing Staples Center torn down. They're seeing these great, you know, buildings and stuff, the Vatican City torn down, and they're weeping and wailing. But the, but the righteous are rejoicing. The scene now changes to a voice that exhorts the heavenly beings to celebrate the vengeance of God against Babylon. Remember the souls under the altar called out for two things. How long, God, before you judge and avenge us? And God judged them during the investigative judgment, which ended with the mark of the beast. And now he's avenging her in the seven last plagues. And here's what the, what the righteous are saying. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. They're not saying, oh, why is God doing that? They're saying, right on, God, you're doing the right thing. They deserve what they're getting. The theme of this verse will be picked up in Revelation 19, 1 to 3 where a heavenly host is singing about the judgment that fell upon the harlot and her cohorts. They're in agreement with God's judgment because he's sovereign and he's done everything he could to save Babylon, including giving his only begotten son. And he's left the door open, but no, none, no more will repent. So it's over. What else can he do? It's like the flood. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. It's over. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard any more in you any more. The party's over. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice, the light of a lamp, the millstone uh, shall not be heard anymore. The millstone, what do you make with a millstone? You crush the wheat and you make bread. Bread represents the word of God. They're not hearing the word of God anymore. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The light of a lamp shall not shine anymore in you. What lamp are they talking about? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Zebulon is over. My YouTube channel, I'm not putting out any more videos because it's, it's over. Um, nobody's preaching the gospel to them. They're running hither and there, but there's no one preaching the word anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard anymore in you anymore. Remember I told you, what is the bridegroom? It represents Christ. And who is the bride? The bride is all the saints collectively from Adam all the way to the last person in the investigative judgment. And hopefully including me and you, we're the bride of Christ. They're, they're not hearing us anymore. They're not hearing Jesus anymore because probation is closed. Shall not be heard in the any in you anymore, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by your sorcery, pharmacia, medication, all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. Hmm. We could go on and on about some of these scriptures, but I'm going to just keep it moving. The picture of the stone being thrown into the sea finds its backdrop in Jeremiah 51, 63 and 64. I'm going to read it right here, where the prophet is commanded to throw a stone into the Euphrates River. He writes out a prophecy, reads it, ties it to a stone and throws it in the Euphrates. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, so in other words, the prophecy that God had given him, and he proclaimed it to the Babylonians, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. 
I don't want to be tied to that stone. The stone here is a metaphor for Babylon. She will be drowned in the waters of the Euphrates. The waters will dry up like the waters of the Red Sea and then avalanche themselves upon the apostate Babylonian system like they did on Pharaoh's army. All the activities that characterize a city will cease when Babylon falls. Babylon deceived the nations by her sorcery, pharmakia. This word appears only in this verse and in Galatians 5.20, but a cognate word, pharmakon, is used in Revelation 9.21.22. The word denotes the use of magic, often involving drugs, and I think it has something to do with the uh, prick and the casting of spells upon people. The simple fact is that those who visit Babylon's pharmacy are not able to think straight. Isaiah 47, verse 9. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. See, one day means what? In a moment, just in a short time. The loss of your children. Remember we talked about who's the children? She has all daughters. Those are the apostate Protestant churches who are teaching Sunday worship and the immortality of the soul. Primarily the two primary lies that lead to um, spiritualism and that lead to breaking the fourth commandment, which is to remember the Sabbath day. And widowhood. She, she's cheating on um, she, oh, she's cheating on Jesus with the kings of the earth and now she's lost them so she's a widow remember she was bragging I'm no widow and I'm a mother of harlots now she's lost her children and her, her husband they shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments the great sin of Babylon is that she persecutes God's people and sheds their blood. This is the picture that we find in every one of the Antichrist passages. And you could, these are all Antichrist passages. And you could read them on your own. Wow. So we're, we finished that part. Wow. Okay, we're finished, but you don't want to miss this next one. Here comes the bride. It's powerful. And we're going to go over this next time. And uh, you don't want to miss that one. If you're going to miss one, you should have missed this one. So um, in closing, let us, uh, let us not be cast into the Euphrates. May we be delivered by God and not receive the mark of the beast. And when Babylon falls, may we not be in it, but may we be outside saying, hey, she got what she deserved. And not inside saying, oh no, weeping and wailing and lamenting. Let us pray. Loving Father, Lord, there's many things going on in the world today, but here at Zebulun, Lord, we focus on your word. If it's not in the word, it doesn't deserve to be heard. That's our motto here. And we follow your spirit of prophecy because the Bible says, despise not the gift of prophecy. And the Bible says that your, your remnant people keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And Revelation 19, verse 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here in Zebulun, we focus on your word and the gift of prophecy. And then as we look at the news and look around in the world, we're looking through Holy Ghost glasses and we understand the events that are transpiring and we act accordingly, calling people out of Babylon that they not partake of her sins and that they not receive of her plagues before the door of probation shuts forever. 
and the five foolish virgins come to the door and it's shut. That represents the close of probation. And they go out to weeping and gnashing of teeth. That represents the time of trouble and the judgments of God poured out on those who get the mark of the beast. We don't want to be in that number, Lord. May we be on the inside of the wedding chamber. When Christ, when the judgment is complete, may all of our names be in the book of life. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, saints. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. And may he lead God and direct you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.